not going to, uh, I don't have those fancy tools, so at the end of the day, you guys are probably going to say that that was the most boring talk ever that you had in your life. You know? It's a boring topic, I know that this is a 14 weeks class that we offer to both undergrad and graduate students. I sh try to shrink it down so that, you know, maybe it's not interesting, but at least it will give you a story. Like silicon, if you have silicon, which is the main building block of the CPU, as an integrated surface, for instance, it is going to be an insulating material unless you dope it with other impurities. But if you shrink down the size, in one of these dimensions, it becomes, say, 4 or 5 nanometers, it starts becoming behaving as a conductor. Again, quantum confines, we will talk about that. That's what we need. Inert materials. Become catalyst like platinum. Inert materials, stable, happy to be there. But as the catalytic converter example that you have seen in the earlier presentation, if you shrink down the size, it becomes a catalyst. What is a catalyst? Catalyst enhances the speed of the reaction before, without getting used. Right? So the reaction do take place on the catalytic converter on the top of the platinum. And um, stable materials turn to combustible like aluminum. Aluminum loves to go into the oxide state. And that's one of the reasons why it's very difficult to make welding to aluminum. Because aluminum oxide is not, it's a ceramic material, right? So it has a very high melting temperature. So instead of 600 degrees, you have to work with around, say, 200, 2000 degrees Celsius. So it's very difficult to weld aluminum. If you shrink down the size, as my colleague has already explained, the surface area maximizes. And it would love to turn into the oxide because of this large surface area. And metal to oxide conversion is exothermic. It releases all a bunch of heat and it becomes combustible. It catches fire. 
take it out immediately, you open the package, immediately catch a spike. Counts very dangerous. So what we will, I will try to do here is, I will focus on two things. One, the surface area, which has already, you guys have already seen. The second one is the, the, the quantum confinement effect. I think we have already done this. So I would like to distinguish between the crystalline and amorphous materials. And for the crystalline materials, I would like to distinguish between single crystalline and polycrystalline materials. So if you have a big brain, that's a single crystalline material. It usually have no effects in there. But if you have, during solidification, it happens to be that you may have several different orientations of atomic planes that gives you a polycrystalline. And within those grains, those tiny, hair like structures are the grain boundaries. That is basically at the terminating regions of the middle crystals. So these are going to be important. That's why I have to introduce the grain boundary concept. One crystal. You can see the shadows of atoms in here, all oriented, stacked in a nice easy fashion. And second one in here, so whenever these two guys come and join, there's a brain one. Decrease electrical travel conductivity, high interface energy, weak bonding, oh, it's corrosion, precipitation, creep, you know, like all these kinds of structures allowed to go into the brain object because it is not happy. Why it is not happy? Because it is not formed in a decent nice fashion. Okay, so where are we? What are the non-structured materials? For that, after the rest, I will talk about that. What's important is that if you have a conventional grain, you will have uh, several billions of atoms. But if you have a non-sized grain, you only have a few hundreds of atoms. Instead, you will have a lot of what um, grain boundaries. Interfaces, where the bonding is not broken. And what type of nanomaterials that we are going to talk today is the thin films, coatings, outlets, zero dimensional, one dimensional materials like nanotubes and nanowires, which I'm always working on these, and the bulk material. But bulk in the sense that the grains are in nano size. And these are the ones that we are going to use for the mechanical applications. <coughs> All the others, but for these bulk in nanograins is going to be used for the uh, mechanical applications. So grain, grain mounted, grain, grain mounted, grain. These white areas are grain mounted. So if you plot the grain size versus the volume fraction of the boundaries, as you do see, if you decrease the size of the grain, both the triple junctions. And the double junctions, they do exponentially increase. So that should give some different properties to the material. Definitely, and certainly. I'm not going to read it all. Experimentally, 1959, that's a big horse thing. Uh, 1981, Letia has synthesized the first non structured material using inert gas condensation. First real time demonstration, 1981, a year after I was born. And then since the landmark paper of the here, there has been increasing interest in the synthesis. If we are going to use these materials at some point in the time, we have to synthesize them in kilogram, maybe in ton quantities. Processing. We have to process them. Uh, characterize. Characterization was already taking place in the morning. Properties and potential applications needs to be determined as well. So synthesize them, process them, and then use them for some why do we study them? Are we mad? Incentives, unique properties. So we are going to talk about any materials. You can um, name six different properties. Electrical, thermal, chemical, magnetic, optical, and mechanical. All these properties will change. We will talk about all these. Except the chemical one. Chemical is the surface. So I'm going to try to cover that in the beginning of my talk. So you do have exceptional properties. And you may use them for ordinary applications. You can use them in car tires. You can use them in your sunblock lotion. Or you can make out new fancy applications, like cancer treatment, targeted drug delivery, that kind of things. So either ordinary is your target, or the new novel application is your target. 
And the capability is also important. Better manufacturing and characterization techniques enable us to study on the atomic scale. Starting from 1981, how many are 33, 34 years, we do have new tools to synthesize these dyes and use them in devices, and systems, and other materials. Effect, everything. Electronics, shrinking down the size of the silicon. I will talk about that. Magnetic devices, USB sticks, used to be 126 megabytes. Now they are like 6, no, 8, 16 gigabytes as far as I um, understand, I, I, I know. Optics, plasmonics, wave lights, we will talk a bit on that. Right? NAMS, NAMS, micro and non electronic systems. And a simple example could be the airbag sensors that we value for the cars. Bio devices, DNA detection, glucose sensors, like in the future, I hate giving them up. Back in the future, you're going to, you know, even from red or from your spit, you should be able to find out your cholesterol level, your sugar level, and everything. Renewable energy. I'm working on solar cells. It's a big example for that. We are making solar cells using number concepts that would, in the future, hopefully, would give you higher efficiencies. They like consumables. All cosmetics. All none. Structures. And also as a material scientist, we are involved in the infrastructure. So, electronics, manufacturing, energy, transport, da 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 da. We increase the list. So it's an unlimited list. But it starts with the material science. So I'm happy to be a material scientist. I mean, it's a, it's a collaboration work, right? Physics, chemistry, material science, all involved. But I believe we material scientists are in the in the core, in the part of the situation. Thermal synthesis techniques, characterization, production, application development, worldwide interest. And what we need to do is to we need to educate the future, gen future generation of scientists and engineers that will evolve and apply these to new novel concepts. Two effects. One, increase in surface area. I think my colleague has already been demonstrated that. And the second one is the quantum confinement effects. This is a tough job. Quantum mechanics is involved, and I'm going to make it simple in this lecture. Two things. So at the end of the day, this is a take-home message. What happens in nano? Size, confined. Easy. Nothing else I don't want to remember from this presentation. Two things. Surface. So these atoms, right? Start with the atoms. Well, you bond them. Iron, coal, metallic, one levels, whatever. Take the primary bonding, chemical bonding. Two atoms. Increase the size, make atoms planes, and then form a bulk. But anyhow, you are going to have a surface where the bonding is not going to be satisfied. This is a covalent bonding example. See, those electrons are sticking out. We call them as dangling bonds. They are like, they are happy. They are not happy, sorry. They are energized. They are not happy because they have free, unpaired electrons. So whatever they see in the ambient atmosphere, they would like to bond into to minimize the <coughs> energy, right? Call the oxygen in there. Call the water molecule there. You know, they can also sometimes, you know, they can find each other to make those electrons happen. So that's the surface. Surface energy is coming from the unbonded electrons. That's the surface energy. And the total energy, to say, is taking into account the surface energy multiplied by the amount of the surface that you would have. So eventually, the higher the surface, the higher the surface energy. And the guy would like to minimize the surface energy. That's one of the reasons why the the easiest, lowest possible energy state is shape is the circle or say sphere. That's the reason. You make a calculation in the same way, so you're going to obviously end up with a low uh, surface area with a sphere. So when you go down to nano, surface energy shoots up. Example, these examples have already been seen, seen, same material, D, total surface area, takes and take out the D in the denominator. The smaller the D, huge the S. Same thing, that was a thin film, that was another particle, surface area, R, radius of each of these individual guys as opposed to this, is in the denominator, exponential increases. So that means that the surface area is going to be increased, the surface energy is going to be increased, and that's the reason why the mantos has exploded. Not an explosion, but that means that was forming the bomb and everything. Made up all the mess in the bomb car. Well, anyhow, so just a small calculation. Surface configuration will impact about two to three atomic layers. So only these two layers. This is not going to be affected, just disappear. 
For sacred particle, for instance, assume the surface region are totally layers for roughly five constructs in that. Surface properties are more important than the materials. Why? Because the calculation is here. Particle size, if it is one micron, only three out of a thousand of these atoms are going to be in the surface. But if you have a two nanometer silicon particle, almost 90% of the atoms will be on the surface. So they will, they will all like to react. That's the reason why aluminum becomes combustible. Here's the graph, that resolution. Students don't like that. Particle size decrease, surface atoms increase, and bulk atoms will decrease, as expected. So these are how we can comprehend what really changes in the atmosphere. Synthesis, I'm sure throughout this, your stay in this week, we will have some synthesis presentations, but two approaches, one top down, start with the bulk material, remove the material, like with conventional methods or lithographical tools, shrink down the size by removing, you waste a lot. Wasteful, not always um, possible to get a small resolution. Or the bottom up, start with the atoms, stack the atoms like Legos. I'm sure you guys all play with that. Right? Each of these little bits are your say atoms, and then you basically build up on top, and you make your structure. Problems. They are too small. <coughs> these are carbonatic. I'm a carbonatic guy. Right? These are small. They love each other. Agglomerate. Coagulate. Very difficult to separate them. Right? So they are going to be like hair string stringes like this. But if you are to ever make devices, this is going to be useless. You have to put them in a stack fashion, older fashion. You have to put them in this configuration. So this is what the nanotechnology experts allow and start to use in the in the, um, in the, in the, in the current time. Right? Depending on the application, gram to kilogram synthesis, for sure, but not in this fashion. In this fashion. So this is going to be a dollar, this is going to be more than a thousand dollars. You have to put them in stack fashion. So okay, properties. Start with the mechanical. I'm going to you know like rush a bit. Mechanical, electrical, optical, magnetic, catalytic. Catalytic we talked about, I believe. We talked about that. The surface discussion is for catalytical chemical properties, the same thing. And then I will give you a flavor of the chemical properties at the end. So we start with the mechanical. <coughs> we take out the material, hold it from the two ends, just try to strain it. Anything, you know, like um, ceramics, metals, or polymers. It could be composites using any of these two together. What is going to happen? The atoms are going to distort a bit. If you release it, they are going to go back. If you don't release it, if you keep on you know, like straining it, there is going to be a point where the atoms don't like to come back to the original situation. So if they could go back, elastic deformation. You do recovery. If they don't come back, it's plastic deformation. You cannot recover. Two things. So looking at the curve, this tiny portion on the left, elastic. The second portion is plastic. But that's the mechanical behavior of materials. So if you know this much, you probably get A's or B's in two classes in our department. But reality is not as simple. Dislocations has already been introduced by my colleague. There are some dislocations that are present in the material. Actually, the plastic deformation is induced by dislocation motion. They have to move. If they don't move, something is wrong. So if you would like to plastic deform the material, reshape the material, for instance, you would like to get the dislocations moving. Um, uh, if they move, this lower the strength, but improve the ductility. Ductility is the amount that you can give the strain, the amount of strain that extension, that you can give to the material before fracturing it. And this last bit is where they fracture, fail. Two pieces. Start with one piece, extend it, extend it. Here you go, two pieces. Dislocations, extra plane of atoms. So they are squeezed into the lattice. So the crystal shouldn't be happy having that. And it would like to get happy by pushing out that dislocation. And if you apply a physical external influence, it's 
dislocation would like to get out of the crystal. Right? Unhappy, unhappy at the other. So how it happens? It breaks these bonds locally and remakes them. And rather than breaking the whole structure, breaking only one bond is a lot more simple. So it gets out. But what happens actually? So we say that dislocation has to move. We say that there has, I mean, I can't believe this time material, there are grain boundaries. So we combine these two. The dislocation is moving. It has a root. They cannot move randomly. It has to go in a certain direction. So whenever it comes to a grain boundary, it has to distort. It has to tilt its direction. Right? Goes up in this fashion, changes the angle of orientation. So whenever the dislocation comes into a grain boundary, it stops. It thinks. How should I go? Change the direction, keeps on going. But there is a delay in between coming to a grain boundary and following up on top of the grain boundary. And the scientists have already found that there is a relation called Foucault's equation. So if you decrease the size of the grains, meaning that increasing the amount of grain boundaries, that would give you higher strength in materials. So the idea is, if we make nano size grains, voila, high strength. True, up to some region. But we will see some contrary arguments when it is not true. Strength, well, don't worry about that. Okay, worry about that. Toughness, toughness is this. The amount of energy that will be absorbed by the material. Plastic. Absorb. <coughs> strength, well, there is no strength, I believe. So, both of them would increase if you size, if you find, uh, if you refine grain size. Up to a certain limit, we will see that in a minute. So how do we refine the grain size? Foraging, rolling, extrusion, drilling, or among all those old movies, like the, the nails under the horseshoes, like the swords and everything, people were nailing basically. It's, it's, it's one of these put which on the roots that's basically forging, but there are some other alternatives that we can use to refine the grain size. Hardness also increases as the same goes with the same principle. Smaller the grains, smaller the grains, higher the strength, higher the hardness. After a certain limit, obviously, we will see that. So here, whole patch, see, grain size decreases, the hardness increases, 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 and as you do see, at around say 10 nanometers, 5 nanometers, depending on the material, there is an inverse relationship. Why? Because the deformation mechanism do changes. The grains are getting smaller and smaller. The grain boundary area is increasing exponentially. If you remember, we say that there are dislocations within the material. Nothing is perfect. You are not perfect either. I'm not perfect either, obviously. But if you shrink down the size, it is going to be very difficult to find the dislocation in a small grain. That's why one of the reasons why the materials are perfect, why because there are no defects. Obviously, if you do this in a um, um, bound material with non-crystalline grains, smaller the grain size, it's going to be very difficult to find a defect, dislocation. And it's going to be very easy to find grain boundaries. So something is basically happening to the grain boundaries, so then this inverse relationship has been observed. And we call this as inverse voltage relationship. Grain boundaries do start to move. Grain boundaries do start to generate dislocations, where the dislocation itself may not be present within the grain, but the boundaries start behaving as a source of dislocation. Don't worry about that. So grain boundaries do slide, grain boundaries do move, so on and so forth. I'm not going to bother you with all these details. Neither those, neither those, neither those, nor those, neither those, neither those. There you go. Grain boundaries do act as a source, and grain boundaries will act the same. So, since you increase the number of grain boundaries, since you make it so small within the grain tailor, dislocations and grain boundary interactions will change. So that gives the inverse pole patch. But, to be honest, no one works with a 10 nanometer grain material. So what they do is they usually operate at somewhere in here. So 100 nanometers is fine for these guys for mechanical applications. So you don't want to tilt the medallion, so you have to work somewhere in here. And that's what people do anyhow. So this is an extreme that I'm basically telling you guys. An example, this is probably from Ireland. Very difficult to find examples of these. 
as you do see in here, as the grain size increases, the stress increases. Both of them, the flow stress and the stress. Here you D is 600 meters grains. The wait, light blue, light blue, as you do see, the stress decreases with the grain size. And obviously, 600 meters, no longer than 600 meters. This is an extreme, just to give you a flavor. If you have to use it for mechanical applications, stay around 200 meters, 500 meters, where the whole pitch equation is still valid. Electrical properties. Gordon Moore, 65, 1965. Are you, I mean, you guys recall Moore's law? Back in 65, that's also a big 4C, right? He said, he's now a co-founder of the Intel. He said that in every two years, the amount of transistors in an IC integrated circuit is going to double. Still, we follow them. Not the right kind of back then, right? So this is the calculations for second. So if you have, if you are limited with this chip size, 8 inch wafers, if you double the number of transistors, obviously you are going to either double the speed, the processing speed, right, which every you guys buy computers or cell phones, faster, faster, faster. People is hungry for speed, or the amount of storage is going to increase that. Right? So we, we follow this for C, right? This is calculations per second, speed per second, right here. So that was around 2005-2006. People started to make devices, each of these transistors, in the region, less than 100 nanometers. Now they recall that rather than putting sidewise, now they are making three dimensions. So the next